any radio restoration results in the inevitable pile of used capacitors, electrolytics, paper caps, film caps, you have all sorts. Some of them look good, some of them look a total mess, but all of them are doubtful because you have one aspect of those caps that is very difficult to measure with a normal capacitance meter, which obviously you use to measure the value. If the value is fine, you may be led to believe that it's fine as well, that the whole cap is fine, but it could actually be suffering from something far worse than a drift in value. And that is that it could be leaking DC voltage. Now a capacitor is supposed to be a open circuit to DC. That's the whole point. It's supposed to let AC through. The amount of AC depends on its value and it's supposed to block DC completely. Now, if it starts leaking DC, then you're ending up with a high value resistor or not so high value, depending on the, on the case in question. And what it does then is that it affects your circuit in ways which can be totally unpredictable, sometimes very destructive. And it is to measure this leakage that uh, I decided to build a uh, capacitance leakage tester and um, be able to use it in the restoration of these old radios to perhaps save some of those capacitors. Uh, not necessarily all of them are bad, but column belief is that you should just change it all because, uh, you know, they probably will be bad. They probably will be leaking. Uh, and the result, obviously, is that you end up with a big pile. Now, if you can avoid that, great. So I decided to design and build this tester. Um, it would be very easy and cheaper to go onto eBay and find an old capacitance tester and do some restoration work on it. Uh, certainly cheaper, but because I'm an incorrigible DIYer, I decided to build one myself. Uh, it always gives you a certain amount of satisfaction and uh, you learn a hell of a lot as you go through it. So what does leakage actually mean? Let's have a look at that. The detrimental effects of uh, leaky capacitors are very easy to, to observe. And um, I'll give you a quick uh, demonstration of exactly what it is that happens when a capacitor gets leaky. Let's have a look at a typical triode stage. You'll have an anode resistor there. There's your anode or plate. There's our grid. There's our cathode. Let's assume this one is cathode biased with a 1K resistor to ground. Let's also assume that we bias it to achieve one milliamp of current through the, uh, through the tube. And typically we will have a grid leak resistor. And this is where our capacitor would be coming from the previous stage, where a high voltage would be present. Now, if we have a situation like this, we can calculate the uh, voltages very easily. One milliamp flowing through one kilo ohm gives us one volt. So here we will have one volt. Here we have zero volts. Here we have zero volts. Now, typically what we'll have here is zero volts because there's no current flowing through here. That's the whole condition of a uh, tube grid that no current actually flows or minimal current actually flows. So if you have zero volts there and you have one volt there then the voltage across here is one volt. So our V uh, grid cathode is the grid is zero minus one is minus one volt and that would be our bias condition for this tube to operate at minus one volt referent to the cathode now what happens if we have a leakage current flowing through this capacitor let's say we have I leakage equals call it one microamp if we have a one microamp, which is a very, very small current flowing through here, this current has got to go somewhere. It doesn't go into the grid, so it has to come through this resistor. So here we would have one microamp. Now let's assume 
that this resistor is, call it 500k. A typical value would be 470, but let's call it 500k. So what you have here is a voltage drop caused by this current at this point, between this point and ground. And that voltage will be, it's 10 to the minus 6 times 500 times 10 to the 3, that is about 0.5 volts. So suddenly we have 0 0.5 volts here instead of 0. Okay? So our V grid cathode is now equal to 0 0.5 minus 1, which is equal to minus 0 0.5 volts. So you see, our bias has gone completely haywire. And that's just with a 1 microamp uh, leakage current. If you multiply that by 10, which is pretty normal, in fact, you can get leakages way in excess of that, what actually happens is that this voltage gets higher and higher. It actually becomes positive, And this um, tube no longer has any restraint on the current that flows through it. So it basically creates effectively a short in this tube because you've got a positive bias. You don't have any negative voltage there to retain the electrons that are being shot off this, uh, the cathode being attracted by the anode. So effectively, you have an overrun here, overheating, and this uh, uh, stage goes to hell. Now, this is what happens in a typical triode uh, preamp stage, for example. If you're looking at a power stage, it's even worse, because what you have here in a power stage this would be the transformer. This would be the output transformer. Now, if you start getting a, an increased current through that output transformer, um, what you're getting is a situation where your transformer literally burns out. And that is one of the most damaging effects of a leakage with this, in this capacitor. And that's why you have to be very, very careful with leakage here. Now, Leakage can affect various parts of the circuit in different ways, but this is probably one of the most dramatic ways that it can affect it. And so much so that it gets to the point where every capacitor prior to the output tubes, in other words, every capacitor that's decoupling or coupling the previous stage to the output tube normally gets changed. You don't take a chance on that. If it hasn't blown it, if it hasn't started leaking, it probably will start leaking in the near future. And therefore, we go straight to these and start changing them when we start a restoration, whether it uh, be a radio or a tube amplifier or anything of that nature. Now, this, these caps here generally have a higher stress level than some others because this is at effectively at zero volts. And this would be at the cathode or plate voltage of the previous stage. So this is pretty high positive voltage. So you have a very high voltage drop across this. It's always stressed and therefore with age it starts leaking and uh, these are the ones that you have to really look out for. Some other capacitors may have very small voltages across them and they might, might be just fine. And that's really what it is that we're trying to do with this tester is to measure some of the leakages, preferably as in circuit as possible. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so that we can perhaps save some of them and not create a hell of a lot of extra work for us when we're doing the restoration. Not only is it extra work, but it also, these capacitors are pretty, 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 I suppose. You could, uh, you could say they, they actually add to the character of the radio that you're uh, restoring. Um, some of them, they look good, they look like they belong, they look the age, and if you can get away without uh, getting rid of it and replacing it with a, a yellow, a little yellow cap, albeit a new one, I think it's best. I think uh, you leave the radio as original as possible and you end up with a product that uh, uh, similar, uh, assimilates the original as much as possible and therefore uh, has higher value. Not only does it work, but it also looks original. In fact, in some cases, you can actually go so far as to drill these out and put a new cap in there so the look stays the same. We're trying to avoid that as well. Electrolytics are a similar situation. Uh, with this electrolytic, for example, you could very easily, 
well, not so easily, but you could dig that out and put a new one in there. So you're actually camouflaging this new one within the old casing, precisely because you're trying to maintain the original look of the radio. And um, if you can avoid it, great. This is a hell of a lot of work, by the way, a hell of a lot of work. If you try some of these, they are a nightmare to restuff. They can be done. I mean, these values are very small. Um, this is 100 microfarad, 12 volts. A new capacitor, 100 microfarad, 12 volts, is probably 5 millimeters diameter, which fits in here. Probably 1 centimeter long, which definitely fits in here. But to actually open this up is a nightmare. Not only is it difficult, but sometimes it's impossible to save the actual casing. Um, as for the electrolytics, another aspect of what we're trying to do here is some of the electrolytics will actually require reforming. Now, one of the uh, side benefits of this uh, tester that we build is because we're actually just creating a high voltage power supply, we're creating a high voltage source uh, to put across these capacitors. If you do it right, you can actually restore some of the function of some of the dried out electrolytics, electrolytic capacitors. For example, this is a uh, this is 100 volt, 100, 110 volt, 10 microfarad. Uh, if this one were leaky, it would probably cause hum in the part of the circuit that it's trying to filter. But if I started applying a low voltage, let's say I started at 30 volts, and I measure the leakage current, and I notice that the leakage current drops, not to zero, but it drops significantly. If I left it in place for some time, that leakage current would drop further to, the, to a point where it would be tolerable. Now, I would then increase that to 50 volts and the same thing would happen. What's actually happen, happening is within this dielectric, within the, the plates of this capacitor, there is a chemical reaction going on which is actually restoring the function of the electrolytic, restoring the insulation properties of that electrolytic that's between the plates. And you can get this resist, this capacitor, some of them anyway, to a point where they are perfectly usable again. Um, the trick here is that you have to be able to vary the voltage. You shouldn't exceed the voltage that you have there. You should stop at the end of that. And you should be able to do it slowly and at a controlled current, so low current. And that's precisely what we're going to build here. This tester has the function of uh, being able to apply a variable B plus from as close to zero to the maximum that we have. And it's also very low current. We don't uh, want this thing to supply 100 or 200 milliamps. Uh, we really only need it to supply maybe one or up to 10 milliamps, for example, worst case, to use it for this function. And that's exactly what we're going to have here. So we can actually use this as a reformer as well. And because it's going to have metering, you can see the voltage that you're applying and also the current that it's drawing at any one time. Right. Now, when I mentioned uh, being able to test these capacitors in circuit, let me explain what it is that I mean. Let us assume that we have our capacitor in circuit. And in this situation, we have it soldered to a tag over there and we have it soldered to a tag over there. Now, one way of measuring this, obviously, is to trying to measure in circuit, but then you've got the effect of the other components, which means you probably will end up with uh, divergent values. The other thing is you can't just apply high voltage to one end of this or across this because you might burn something else at that end. So what you need to do is really take this out of circuit and measure it and test it outside of its uh, circuit environment. A hell of a lot of work usually because these connectors, these tags are sometimes pretty infirm, pretty old and pretty sensitive. So if you desolder it and put too much force on it trying to wiggle out that wire you can in fact break it break the connector then you've got another problem um, so ideally you should remove it but if you do not want to there's another way of going about it and this is what they used to do a lot uh, in in the old days or when these radios were being restored or repaired um, as a matter of course and what they would do is they would leave it soldered in place there and they would just cut it say there now that's going to jump but imagine that that stays there now if i cut it over there i can then bend it out and measure this thing in circuit or out of circuit if my power supply or rather if my tester is floating 
I can apply its ground to this point here. So I can apply its ground to that point there. And then I have my tester and I can apply this my B plus to that point there. And effectively, because this is ground, it doesn't do any damage to the surrounding circuitry. The only appliance or the only part that will have voltage across it is this capacitor. That part there is safe. Now, let's imagine that this particular cap turns out to be fine. Now I have to reconnect it to its existing point over there. And the way they used to do it is they used to actually used to buy these things. But the way I do it is you take a little very thin screwdriver, a little bit of wire, and you create a little coil. fairly tight together. That'll do. So what I have now is I've created this coil, which I can then remove. And what I have here is a little coil of wire that I can then stick into there I stick into, let's ignore that one, let's imagine that it's this one. I then stick into there. And I put a bit of flux on there and I solder it. And what I end up with is a very, very good connection to the uh, existing piece of wire that would be coming out of there. This connection would be as good as if I had removed it and connected it directly to that point. And I have not risked the damage, any damage to that point there or that point there. Now, assuming this capacitor is bad, then all I do is I remove it. I cut it there as well, remove it, and I will end up with a piece of wire sticking over here. I will then take my new capacitor and wind the end of the, that new capacitor, wind it into two little coils like that one, and I will stick it into that end, stick it into that end, solder there, solder there, and I have my replaced capacitor without stressing the solder tags. So it works both ways. Effectively, when you cut this capacitor to test it, you are performing the first half of a substitution anyway. So if it turns out that it's bad, you just do the next one and you replace it as you normally would. So you're not actually adding to the work. You might be saving a lot of work if you find that this capacitor is fine. Then all you do is you do that one connection and you're there.